Earthlings, Earthlings, welcome back to the Waveform Podcast. <laughs> We're your hosts, I'm Marquez. And I'm Andrew, and I did not approve of that intro. It's just the way it's gone this week. <laughs> um, this week we got a guest on, actually. Yeah? Who's your favorite car YouTuber? You. Oh, wow. That's that's <laughs> just such a nice, flattering answer to that. My favorite is Doug DeMiro. Yeah, I think that's everybody. You've favorite. seen me watching his videos. I watch his videos. Yeah. I know lots of people that watch his videos. I think every car video for the past two years that I've put out has had at least one section inspired by his videos. Usually when I go through quirks and features, mm -hmm. but also when I went through the McLaren, I did a whole Doug DeMiro inspired section. Big fan. If you guys haven't Huge seen fan, his yeah. videos before... Well, of course, link his channel in the show notes, but got a chance to talk to him. I feel like we have a lot in common, actually, mm -hmm. because we are YouTubers, but not just YouTubers. We're YouTubers who make videos about products. Yeah. And so that's kind of like the thing that we bond over. And so in this conversation, we talk all about that kind of stuff, about car culture versus tech culture, about being a creator online, about the uncertainty of it, about getting recognized in public. There's all sorts of fun yeah. quirks and things that we realize we have in common. I'm um, really excited. He is also the... He's the perfect first guest to do the the type the ABC challenge because yeah. um, it, it's literally inspired by Top Gear, and I'm sure having a car YouTuber doing our first Top Gear esque challenge. It's perfect. It's perfect. It's perfect. Can't wait. So yeah, we'll see how he does. But without any further ado, Doug DeMiro. All right. Cool. Sick. Well, welcome, uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to the Waveform Podcast. It's been a long time coming. First of all, I've watched your videos for years. For many years, I was never a car person until probably like 2016 and then started, obviously I got a car I was really into and started watching way more car videos. So that's obviously what yeah. led me to find your channel. I'm sure that's how a lot of people also do. Um, but Doug, I mean, for those unfamiliar, for a couple of people who haven't seen a Doug DeMuro video, how do you have like a two minute version of like, Here's what I do maybe when someone asks you in the street or you have to explain to a family member or something. How would you describe what you do? I, I'm very sheepish when I have to explain it to normal people. But the the, the general gist is that I, I review cars and it's sort of an unusual way. I like kind of show all of like a bunch of little – as opposed to just like driving it like, oh, this is really fast. I like show a bunch of little details and stuff um, that maybe you would encounter if you actually like owned the car or wanted to spend some time with it or whatever. And I think that that – it's a little bit is a little bit unique, and I've been able to do a crazy cars from normal stuff to multi million dollar cars. Is that you don't always get a chance to see all those little details. It's kind of yeah, cool. I like that. I mean, I think we have a lot in common. I I I also have a YouTube channel, and my videos are very product based, which I think is a unique part of YouTube because there's a lot of people who are vlogging and are trying to make the the lifestyle as exciting as possible. There's a lot of other sort of topical channels and things like that. But when we get a product, which is the car or in your case, or the gadget in my case, that dictates like right. about as exciting as the video can be is like how exciting that thing is. Um, do you think about right. that at all? Is that like, do you feel an extra pressure to be like a better version of Doug today? Or is it kind of like the car will do the talking? <laughs> That's an interesting question. I never really thought about that distinction between the product people and the vlog people. But I guess you're right. For the vlog people, the, their vlog and their personality is their product, basically. But for me, it's maybe a little bit easier in the sense that I like have something that I can talk about the whole time. So if I don't have something interesting that day, like the car is interesting. Um, yeah, that I that that like really never <laughs> really struck me. In terms of like yeah, being like on and stuff. Yeah, I mean it can be a little uh sometimes you show up and you just don't want to do it. I'm sure you have this. There's some days where you're just tired and you're like I don't Yeah. Know. But sometimes the car totally pulls me out of that. And it's like, this is actually a lot of fun. I'm glad. Like you you're not jaded or anything. Like you you enjoy like as many cars as you possibly can still. I can't believe it, but after eight years, I'm not even slightly jaded. I still pull up, even to like review a minivan, and I'm like, "All right, <laughs> like I'm pumped. Let's see what's going on." I don't know how that that lasted so long. Or do you feel? No, jaded? I was I was thinking that. I don't think I am. I there is a level of like experience that comes with it because there's a part of the the tech world where like the reaction to the novelty of something new will kind of be a part of the video. Like some new feature will happen in a phone. And you're supposed to react accordingly based on how interesting or impressive that thing is. And a lot of times 
like something pretty cool. Like they put uh, cameras behind the the display now. So like instead of having a hole punch cut out, it'll just be like magically seamlessly behind the screen. And the, the camera won't take the best photos, and I'm like, I can kind of see it from the side, so I'm like not really raving about it. But then half the comments are like, this is incredible. Like, how are you not like amazed by the the craziness that we're seeing in front of us? So it's kind of it's kind of a balancing act of like remembering to not not remembering to be impressed, but to remember the context right. of like not everybody has seen all this stuff, you know. Right. That was that was the reason I started doing these like quirks and features videos. I would watch car reviews and there would be some button that looked insane that I you know had a symbol on it. And I didn't know what it did, but they wouldn't because that person had been in three of those models, you know, by the same brand before. They knew what that did. It wasn't interesting to them. I was like, you know, I want to start talking about this stuff like it's to somebody who is like coming at it from a fresh. And so sometimes people are like, how could you still be surprised by whatever feature? And it's like, I don't know. I, I still am. <laughs> Maybe I'm just an no, idiot. I, li I like that I can watch any one of your videos and you don't actually need the context of any other video. You know, like if, if you watch right. a, a tech video reviewing the Galaxy S21, a lot of stuff will refer back to the S20. And you kind of have to remember what that was like. And I feel like any any video of yours that I watch, even if I've never been in any other car by that manufacturer, I can slowly get to know all of the pieces of that car, which is kind of cool. I wouldn't I wouldn't get that anywhere else. It's a tough thing to do, though, and I'm sure you have a difficult time with this also because some people watch every video. And if you are repetitive, they're like, you already talked about that in this video and this video and this video. And it's like, OK. But then some people watch – this is the first time they've watched. And so it's a tough balance to try to make that work. Like do I talk about this again even though I just did three months ago yeah. or uh, – and you're going to get complaints. Yeah, do you, <laughs> you just kind of got to – do you, do you dig into the numbers at all, like the YouTube analytics and all that stuff? Yeah, insanely. I've got spreadsheets. And, really? Yeah. Really? What well. do you – so yeah, what is I, your ratio of returning on a new upload maybe, let's say a week old video, what is your ratio of new viewers versus versus repeat? You know, that actually I don't know offhand, but um, – but it's enough that a good chunk of them are returning video viewers and then a good chunk are. And also it depends a lot on the car. Um, if it's something that's sort of like – like I just did a review the other day of a 1986 Nissan Maxima. That's going to be people who are like Doug yep. fans. You know, that's not – but if it, it – like I'm doing the Bronco videos going up tomorrow, um, that's going to be a ton of new people who just want content on this new car. And, and so it, it depends greatly on the vehicle. And so I kind of try to think of that too, but it's still – it's still so difficult. I mean, the problem is when you have audiences the size of mine, and obviously yours is even bigger, like, there's so, God, it's just so difficult to figure out how, and it just comes with experience breeds the, you know, you figure out eventually, like, what people want, whatever, but I still sometimes am, like, blown away that something became something. I'll post a video, talk about it, and, like, well, something will be a minute in the video, and I won't even think about it, and that will be the thing everybody talks about. Yeah. I'm like, I didn't even, it's... That stuff kind of blows me away. Oh, yeah. Sometimes. We literally just had a moment like that. I guess I can't talk about it yet because it's not out yet, but we just saw a new phone come out, and there wasn't that much cool stuff, but there was, like, one kind of neat feature that we grazed over. And we're like, wait a second. That's actually kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, I want to ask right. you. You make your videos. I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess because I don't know, but that you shoot them with an iPhone. Is that right? I shoot. It's kind of complicated. The stand-up shots, so the ones where I'm standing next to the car, going, you know, this is whatever. I have a camcorder for that, and the ones that I'm standing in, sitting inside the car, where it's shoot. Any anytime I'm appearing on screen, the camcorder is shooting it. On the little overlay shots where you see me touch the button or turn on the headlights or whatever, that is always with okay. an iPhone. And you know, the funny thing about that is. People get angry when they find out that I'm shooting this with an iPhone. They're like, this isn't professional. But they'll only realize when that, that that happened when they see it in reflection. And it's like, you've been watching my videos for two years. Never would have known. <laughs> exactly. Like, a big deal. Yeah. No, I, I, I kind of admire that a little bit. Like, I go out to shoot a car video sometimes, and it I, I am so used to this, like, production of, like, how can I make the best video possible? That it's it's a little bit daunting. Like it weighs on me a little bit. Like we have all this gear and then suddenly it's like now we have to worry about every single little thing because if we're going to this height, we might as well go to this height. Um, so so right. part of me wants to just like shoot a, a whole car video with my phone and, and not even like think twice about it. So I kind of love that. How long... I always tell people, I always tell people that quality, the thing is you're making videos to a tech audience and so they're going to notice quality a little bit more, I think. Um... I don't necessarily have that. <laughs> I don't necessarily have that problem. So people don't seem to care. You got to have a certain standard, 
but you don't have to be as insane as I expected. And as insane as some people think, people email me and they're like, I've got this piece of equipment and that and this drone, whatever, and I'm gonna make the best car videos. And I'm like, eh, that's not necessarily what people are after. You, you might be surprised. The content is really, to me, is always kind of oh, more it's important. King. So, okay, for a 20 minute video, how long does that take you to make? Well, you, you have a shoot, you have a writing process too, but how long does everything take you? Um, I would, it takes about two hours to write a script and research everything. And the script is really only the intros, but it's also some research to figure out like, what am I going to, what is this car about? And then I go to wherever it is and it's very rarely local. So, you know, a couple hours on the road and then I get up there, it takes about four to five hours to film a video, depending on how, um, complicated the car is. Older stuff without touchscreens is easier. It's quicker. Um, modern cars, people want a little bit more in depth on like the, how does stuff work, that kind of thing. And then the editing process, I finally hired an editor. I was doing it all myself up until last year. I finally hired an editor. And he, uh, so it took, it used to take me about the same amount of time to edit, three, three to four hours to edit a video um, and, and post it. Was well. that process, was that your first uh, addition to the team, having an editor straight to the top with an editor? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. I, my best friend also reads my emails, which is helpful. So she's, I, she's sort of my assistant to an extent, reads my emails, and then I have my editor. How big is your team? Uh, so currently not nine, including me. Um, but I am the editor still. So that's like the, the, the weird, that's what I always get flack for is like, all right, there is so much, there's so much to do. There is the writing and researching and I have help with that, which is great. There is also like the shooting, which there's all kinds of angles and stuff I can't get. So I have help with that. Um, and there's set design and there's all sorts of like animation and things inside videos. But as far as like the base cut and like who's making the video, that's me in front of the computer for six hours. So yeah, wow. it is, it, I feel like that's, that's something that like, it's hard to give up as a YouTuber. I don't know if you. Absolutely. I, I, I didn't, I didn't want to give it up. And in fact, I loved editing. Yeah. I it's still, I, if I had time, cause we just launched this, I just launched this like car auction website. And if I still, if I wasn't doing that, I would still be doing the edit. I loved it. It's like putting together a puzzle and you kind of shape it and shape it and shape it. And by the end you have this like this thing. And I found that to be probably more enjoyable than actually shooting. Um, it just was the one I can't farm out the shooting obviously. And so it made sense to farm out the editing huh. it was too bad, but I'm glad, I'm glad there's still YouTubers that are out there editing and missing editing. Um, <laughs> do you, how much do you get to experiment inside of your videos then? Cause you, you, you clearly have the format and you have the Doug score and you have the driving section and you have quirks and features that I like expect you to hit, even if I know nothing about the car. Do you feel like you have to do a video a certain way on the main channel or is that sort of like? Yeah. Well, you know what? The, 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 ba the big benefit is that's actually what I enjoy the most. I started off doing all these crazy videos. I would run over cars and I would, I don't know, all sorts of crazy stuff. And I just sort of refined and refined to the point where I got to what my audience liked the most. And it just by chance, it's also what I like the most. I like to see what all the little buttons do. I like to see how everything is controlled, how the gadgets all work, how you know, the seat can, whatever it is. And it turns out that's, that's what the audience likes the most yeah. too. Um, so it's fine. I have this second channel, although I've started putting most of my second channel videos on my, on my main channel, but I have that too, but where I can do some more experimentation and have a little bit more fun. Do you, I love that you're in the numbers cause now I can ask the nerdy questions. Do you, do you see retention spikes at the, like, um, Cause you go, yep. you get, you have a point where you start to drive the car and like, that's a different scene and everyone knows right. that. And then you have the Doug score. Is the Doug score the highest part of the yeah. video or like what, what happens? No, the Doug score is not the highest, but it often will go higher than the driving. What I have learned is that nobody really cares about the really? driving. I think, I think there's a few reasons for that. I don't think it's that nobody cares. I just think that people who are casual people will watch the quirks because they're interested but like casual people who aren't interested in the car they don't really care how it drives it's people who want to buy the car that maybe want to see okay what does it drive like and that's a lot less people than actually watch the video and then yeah people come back for the doug score and there are spikes at quirks that are interesting too so what must happen is people must link people to those exact spots and then the, that's where some people yeah, start. Definitely. <laughs> and I, and they recently introduced that feature where you could see where the spikes are and stuff. And I was like, oh my God, I never knew this was really It's happening. really helpful. It it's like, and then you, cause some people will link yeah. to that part of the video, but also some people will replay the same thing more than once where they're like, wait a second, I was kind of on cruise control right. watching this video, but I need to see that again. Right. So that's like kind of cool right. to see. And then you can go back and. Is it the same for you? Do you see, do you see spikes at, at parts of the video that are, that are. Oh more yeah. yeah. I mean, so the intro is obviously the, we, we put a lot of effort into the first 10 seconds or so of almost every video. So you'll see that spike, but then you'll see like, 
uh, there'll be like a, a certain weird animation or feature that happens where I have to point it out and show it to you on camera. And people will replay that a bunch of times yeah. and you see a really big spike and it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. But yeah, no, it's, it's <laughs> usually a pretty reasonable curve, I think. Uh, I wanted yeah. to ask you about your background because you came from, uh, I guess I would say a more traditional media. I mean, you were writing basically before you were making videos and then yeah. went to being a YouTuber. Yeah. And in this tech world, there is there are tech writers and there are tech YouTubers. And the tech YouTubers, I feel like, are still trying to earn some level of respect and, and, and consideration that traditional media have always had. Do you find, now that right. you've been in both worlds, do you find there's a big difference between doing written and doing YouTube in the way you talk to brands and companies, for example? You know, that's a really interesting question. A lot of people ask me just on a general level, how do the brands handle YouTube? But it's a really interesting question, the difference between writing and, and YouTube. One, one important point is I never wrote for print. Um, and in the car space, print is still, probably this isn't true in the tech space anymore, I hope. But print is, is still in the car space sort of viewed as like the, the old medium that's the most important. The brands still view it as the most important, which I think is beyond insane. But um, compared to digital writing versus, di versus YouTube, I don't see a huge difference. But I still have an enormous amount of trouble getting some brands to, to care about YouTube. And I can look at them and say, look, I'll get two, three million views. This is more than the circulation of these magazines that you're bending over backwards to try to impress. Um, you know, I, this is going to be a big thing. And it's still like, you're an influencer, you're not a journalist. We don't, you know, some for some of them, some of the brands have clearly yeah. figured it out. But it's amazing because there are studies out there that say over 80% of new car shoppers will watch at least one video before buying. And I think it's probably more like 90 plus, but you know, I don't know who's yeah. not, right? And I try to tell them that and it's just kind of an old, there's still an old mentality of that sort of thing. I imagine in the tech space, it's a little bit better, I hope. Um, I mean, there is some element of both sides to it. Like I, I think it probably depends on the demographic. I think for a lot of people under probably about 30, somewhere around my age maybe, uh, they look at YouTube and they look at videos just as seriously as they would anything else. If we were buying a phone, for example, like you're going to watch a new video about the phone before it comes out or before you buy it. Right. But, you know, there's obviously a lot of older people like my, my grandparents basically can't find a way to acknowledge anything that I do unless it's printed somewhere. And they're like, okay, now that's cool. That is real. Like, that's very cool. <laughs> So I always found that funny. And I, I recently started contributing to Top Gear magazine, which is a printed magazine. And that was the same like sort of experience. I've been making these autofocus videos for like a couple months now. It's not as many, but Top Gear magazine. Oh, that's that's established. Right. That's, that's traditional. Something. So that that's always I, it's always been there. It is kind of funny. I um when this started and people would start coming up to me on the street and recognize me and such, people people would say, Oh, you're internet famous. And I I I've tried to it's an interesting thing when you get to a certain level. I mean, you it's the internet is it now. I, I don't know like TV actors anymore, really. Like when I was a kid, you grew up with like friends and Seinfeld. You knew all those people. It would be, if you ever saw one on the street, which you, uh, I would be like, oh yeah. my God, this is the yeah. craziest thing in the world. But that stuff is fractured and splintered so much that like this is kind of like what it is now. But yes, it's very hard to explain that to older generations. And I still have older relatives being like, so are you still doing that that video stuff? <laughs> You're still, yes. you're still doing that? Yes, mom. And I'm like, yeah, I, uh, I'm doing it. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> still going so do you today. have, so you have people probably in the streets, like saying hi to you, probably like recognizing your car and stuff like that? Yeah. Yeah. All the time, you know, at least once a day. And it's great. It's always so much yeah. fun. Everybody's always really nice. I've never had a negative encounter. Have you? No. Uh, I would say the closest thing I had to a negative encounter was... I met someone for the first time outside an event and they immediately started correcting me on something I got wrong in one of my previous <laughs> videos before even saying their own name. Yeah, I get those experiences. Yeah. So I feel like that's <laughs> in a product related channel, that's probably a feeling people have deep inside when when a fact that they know is wrong. <laughs> Uh, Did the person just have that ammo ready to go in case 100%. they met you? They were like, if I ever meet this yeah. dude. <laughs> 100%. Which, which is I, great. I occasionally get that occasionally some like, Oh, you, my car, you know, why didn't you say more nice things? But generally people are really nice, but it's such a bizarre thing um, that I still like wrestle with. Like, this is so weird. 
And there's a little bit of um, anxiety around it, which I don't think most people realize. Like, you can't ever be mean to anybody ever in the public. Like, that can never happen. You can't. And every time you walk into a place, like, people are, there's might be a few people who, like, recognize you. And so you can't, like, trip over your dog, you know? <laughs> <laughs> people are like, that. No, that's <laughs> real. Weird. I always have a little more yeah. anxiety. No, I feel like I just, I just tweeted a, a clip. I don't know if you saw this. There's a... I have a sentry mode clip on my car, which is just recording when people come near the car, uh, of like uh, two people walked up to the car and just started taking pictures in front of it. And that like, that's fine. That happens. But there's always like, diff- I can see different versions of that happening. One is someone will walk by and like see the car and recognize it from the videos and like take a picture of it. And I'm like, right. oh, that's fine. Cool. Right. And then there's this clip, which was this this girl like leaning on the hood of the car with a photographer taking pictures of her on it. And I was like, that's different. That's not the same thing at all. Really right. odd. Um I, it's just a, it's a hard, it's a, it's a different world to navigate, but yeah, I feel like I have the same experience as you. This episode of the Waveform Podcast is brought to you by Blackview. Have you ever been in a situation where a dash cam would have come in handy? Like maybe say loaning your car to a YouTuber for five hours? Before it's too late, get the day and night protection your vehicle deserves with Blackview DR750X Plus Series Cloud Dash Cams. So whether you're driving around on a busy road or waiting for a traffic light to change or just park for the night, Blackview dash cams have your vehicle covered. And the Blackview DR750X Plus model features an upgraded Sony Starvis sensor, um, so it gives you stunning clarity and vivid colors even in the most challenging of lighting situations. Great dynamic range is something I find super important in cameras that we use on the channel for realism, but the DR750X Plus is no different. It offers great dynamic range to make sure you never lose any important information in harsh lighting conditions on the road. And the front camera also records at 1080p, 60fps, so you won't risk losing information even at higher speeds. So with Blackview Cloud, you can rest easy knowing you can check in on your car at any time uh, and even receive notifications on your phone. So go to blackview.com slash waveform and use promo code waveform to get 10% off any Blackview dash cam Free shipping on orders over 200 bucks. So that's B L A C K V U E dot com slash waveform, promo code waveform. One of my sadnesses as a car person is that I never can have like a clean automotive encounter anymore. Everybody always recognizes me. And so, like, once a year, someone will come up to me about one of my cars and not recognize me and and just talk about mm-hmm. the car and I will savor the hell out of that. I'll talk keep them there. I'll be like, "Oh, so anyway, <laughs> because it's just like this is a pure car interaction that I get yeah. to have. And it's so rare because the moment someone recognizes me and I'm sure you it becomes a it's, they start talking about you and the channel and whatever and it's like less about the stuff that I'm you know, more into. Yeah. Which is kind of a funny thing that I never expected. No, it's funny. The car culture has more of that than tech culture. Inevitably when someone meets me they're like, "What phone is in your pocket?" Like, "What do you like sort of that sort of question line where in the car world, I've noticed this and maybe this is just a small subset of the car world, but at a Tesla supercharger with the newest Tesla, other ch- people charging there will get out their car and be like, hey, how do you like it? Like, tell me about the car. And often it's yeah. they're not asking you about your own channel. They're like interested about the car. Yeah, and so yeah, like yeah. the car culture is kind of neat in that way I found. Can we talk about the... Can we talk about the plaid? I, for I a would moment? like to because I feel like I saw one in your new video, but it wasn't part of the video. It was like a teaser. You were, you had it in front of you. Yes, I got a video going up. I got a video going up on it soon, but I will reveal my thoughts. Okay, I would love um, that. And I, I I listened to your podcast on it, so I I already generally know yours, but I I think it was insane. I think it's one of the craziest and coolest cars that I've ever experienced in my entire life. And I'm not like, I know that you're a big electric car fan. I'm not like the hugest Tesla guy. I love their products. I think they're, to me, they feel a little bit, they're less like enthusiasty and emotional to me than a lot of cars, but I think they're great for a lot of people and I recommend them to mm-hmm. a lot of people. But I think Plaid is the first one that I like emotionally connected with. And I told, I was telling people when I got home, like, I think I'll remember for as long as I live, like three major events in my career YouTubing about cars so far. One was like driving the Ferrari F40, which was like my first true vintage supercar, very special. Another was the first time I sat behind the wheel of Super Cruise, which was like the first of those driver assist technologies I had been in. It was on my 30th birthday and the car was changing lanes and I was like, "This, I'm, the future is here. And I think number three will be pushing the throttle down in plaid <laughs> and feeling that acceleration. Yeah. I, yeah. 
I'm like, I was like astonished by how it that is, felt. And you're just cruising around it in is, this thing. It is very, it's wild to me a couple things. One, that that's just going to be in the hands of regular people. Like, I, I am yep. a regular person. I was able to order one, and now right. I have it, and that is now a possible thing to happen. Wild. Um, yeah, I was so curious. So Tesla doesn't have a PR department, so I'm, I'm always curious how people's Tesla experiences happen. Did you ha you met an owner, or did you get right. – how did you even find yeah, one? Yeah, well, that's a good question. And, and the way that it always happens for me is, yeah, an owner reaches out. And – it's always the best because I actually prefer it like that for every any car I can where I can get an owner is best because there's no BS you have to deal with with the manufacturer. You don't have to worry if they're going to cut off your flow for future cars, whatever. So I actually kind of like it with Tesla that it always just ends up being a guy. So yeah, it was an owner. Um, a bunch of owners reached out to me. The car happened to come out like the, the first deliveries were like the day I went on a long vacation. And so by the time I got back, I was like already getting like conspiracy theory emails like you haven't reviewed this because you're being paid by the other manufacturers not to review Teslas. And I was like, oh my God, I guess I need to review one. Yeah. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I went to an owner and I just kind of, you know, filmed the whole thing and then drove around. And, and yeah, his. I, I think it's, it's probably, the, I didn't expect to notice a difference because I've driven a, a performance Model S for years and, you know, I've driven Taycan and I've driven McLarens and I've, I've never expected right. to really feel a big difference in acceleration. I assumed it would always right. be incremental. And yeah, I think yep. the, the, I was driving it back to the studio from picking it up, which is, it was maybe a 20 something minute drive. And I was like, oh, I'm going to baby this thing. Like, I'm going to get it wrapped in a week. I don't want to do anything crazy. And then I got to a stoplight and I was like, well, it is in plaid mode. So let me just give it one. And yeah, I don't know if I've ever cursed that many times in such a short amount of time. It was unbelievable. It's hard to explain. I, I got lucky because I got my initial reaction on camera. Nice. And I, um, I've never... <laughs> I just, it was so insane. And like you said, yeah, regular people, maybe, you know, when I was a kid, if you went and got like a Lamborghini Diablo, first off, you had to kind of have some skill. Those were not easy cars to drive. It was a heavy clutch. You had to know how to drive a manual. You had to be able to get in and out. And they weren't that fast, right? They were zero to 60 in five seconds or something like that. Now, like any, any lawyer can just show up at a Tesla store in the mall, right? And order the fastest car in human mm -hmm. history. That's it insane. Is. That's the craziest it thing. It is. Ever. Are you do you are you fearful of this? You know how fast this thing is. Aren't you scared that there's gonna be some crazy You know what? It's the last one was super fast too. So like not I'm not more scared about this one. It's just like the yeah. the the, the ability to do crazy things has always been there. It's just a, it's so easy this time. Like you mentioned, like there are other older yeah. cars yeah. where you could go fast, but it, you you had to know how to use it. Where like more so than ever. You just stomp it and all-wheel drive is just like, now you're going yeah. 140. And you're like, what What do you mean? that? It yeah. shouldn't be that easy. So, yeah, that, I don't know. I'm glad you got your hands right. on the car and I can't wait for that video. Yeah, me too. I'm really excited for the video too. I'm excited to see it go up. It's um, super desired. And I've never done a Model S video before because right. it was a, by the time I started filming cars, it was kind of old or, mm. you know, like – and so this is like a big deal for the channel. The, the, the plaid is the – and it's so yeah. insane. It's so, so insane. You want to drop any exclusives about the Doug score? You want to give any hints, any surprises? I haven't. I I don't, I don't score them until like the video is being uh, edited. But I I can't imagine just sitting here thinking about it. And when I was thinking about it at the time, how is it not the highest Doug score? When you think about the practicality of it, and I mean, it's amazing to me. The world's fastest accelerating car. One of the selling points on Tesla's website is that you can fit a bicycle in the back without taking off two. the wheel. I've done I've done <laughs> two <know>. in the <laughs> back. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Think about that. Like the Ferrari, the La Ferrari, mm -hmm. that wasn't one of the things you could do with that car. That, yeah. wasn't, that wasn't in the list of things. And here we are. Like uh, it's it's incredible. It's just an amazing feat yeah. to be honest. And there's a lot of there's a lot of people out there and especially there's a lot of car people out there. And I'm sure you've noticed this who are anti Tesla and anti electric car. And I try to be super objective. Um and I love gas powered cars and I love the old school and the engines and shifting gears and I have several manual transmission cars. But how do you, how do you not? It seems like, think this is yeah, thing? no, I, I feel like I know a good amount of car people that I've seen that have a bunch of cars in the garage and daily drive a Tesla. And I always found that fascinating. And it, yep. to me, it's like the reason yep. I got the car is because I believe it's pretty much the best available daily driver. Like it's a fun performer. It has a ton of space. It's got the tech, like everything about it is great. Um, but it's always interesting to me seeing, uh, you know, people with like seven, eight, nine cars 
who daily drive the Tesla. And it's like, that's, that makes a lot of sense. I think, and I think you're right. I think like in terms of an overall car, how do you possibly come up with a better, I like the Taycan too, by the way. And I, I'm, frankly, I may have chosen that before I drove Plaid, but this was like, it was almost like a religious experience. I was in the same boat. That throttle. <laughs> same boat. I reviewed the Taycan. I was like, this is the one I would get if it could supercharge and I'd take it all yeah. back. So, um, now you mentioned, yeah. yeah. How do you, here's the question. How does it improve from here? Oh God. You know? What are they going to do next? Well, everyone now is, is referring to the Roadster because the Roadster is the two-door specifically sport-focused version. They can go to the next level. It's a it's a quarter million dollar car. They can really focus on performance. But like, I again, I, I have a really hard time picturing a, a car actually feeling faster than that. Um, right. So they have to do, right. they got to do something else exciting, right? I mean, it's a two-door, it's a coupe, it's got space, but like... <laughs> And the thing about Roadster, I'm sure it'll be cool. I'm sure it'll handle better and like be a real. But the problem is when you start getting into that price point, the accessibility factor is lost and it almost gets into one of those like, well, it better be whatever True. because it costs that much. And obviously it's going to be faster than gas powered cars that cost equivalent, but 250 is still an enormous True. amount of money and it's not feasible for most people. I think that's one of the coolest things about Platt. It's not like 140 is, ex is mm -hmm. cheap. But when you look at what it can do, 140 When it compares cheap. to every every performance comparison is with a seven-digit car, then you know that it's probably a bit of an outlier yeah. there. Yeah. You mentioned, uh, so you got it from an owner, but you've dealt with you've dealt with car companies in the past, like review units is what they're sort of referred to in the tech world. Um, do you have any like review unit horror stories or is it mostly smooth sailing? Cause I'm with cars, it's a little different. I've had cars for a couple days or, or a week or so. And it's like, you have to deal with insurance more and you have to deal with like, what right. if there's rock chips on the car when you give it back and how many miles you're allowed to put on it. So it's a little different. Right. right. Yeah. They send the, the, the press cars. Um, I really, for a very long time, I tried to avoid any press cars because I always felt that if the manufacturer is providing you with something, mm -hmm. then, you know, there's there's a question of objectivity there. And so for years, I wouldn't take press cars or I would take one every couple months or something. But when COVID happened, my wife and I were trying to get pregnant and we I just didn't want to go to car dealerships, which are like notoriously some of the most conservative. But I didn't want to deal with any of that stuff. So I started getting more press cars coming in and, and that that started to come in. And so I do that a lot more now, although I still think it's kind of a 50 50 split with owners and, and press cars. Yeah, the cars come to your house with a full tank of gas and fully washed. And I know some car journalists who don't possess a personal car. And so at that point, you have to wonder these guys need this to continue, wow. right? Like, the, is are they really being objective? They can't. And, and meanwhile, these are car people who don't – car journalists who don't own a car. I know many of them yeah. who don't. And so I always try to kind of resist that thing. But, at the, it, but yeah, they show up and then you have it for a week or whatever and you provide your impressions. The one big benefit to it, even as questionable as all that sounds, and I still think it's very ethically dubious – Having a car for a week, you really do get the chance to – you drive it at night, you drive it in traffic, you drive it in rain, and you get the chance to really kind of experience it more than me showing up at a guy's house, driving it for an hour, filming it for five, you know, four hours, and then it's not quite the same. Yeah, that was always my challenge with car videos is I want to spend more time with them, like a phone. Like one of the common questions I get is how long does it take you once you've gotten the thing – to figure to feel like you you know it well enough to to give your impressions or whatever. Like with headphones, I can I can spend three hours with a pair of headphones and know everything about them. Short of like battery life, I can know everything about a pair of headphones. You give me a smartphone, it's like, okay, I want to go through the battery cycle a few times. Give me like four, five, six days before I really feel like I know this very well. Really? And and I think that's pretty wow. short because in a lot of worlds where you don't know phones as well as someone who's used a thousand phones, you need more time. But for a car, it's like, yeah, yeah I'd want to, I'd want at least a week. I'd want to, I'd want a weekend and yeah. I'd want a week where I'm, I'm commuting in it and all this sort of stuff. Um, how long? And then you think about, then you think about there's 30 car manufacturers and they're each coming out with three new cars a year. And so if you really wanted a week with each one, it's actually not, when you think it's not actually possible, yeah. right? And that's, that's, that kind of starts to become a little bit of the time. How long is the longest you've spent with a review car? And how long is the shortest? They, the, the, <laughs> The shortest is is like when I go up show up at somebody's house and I'll usually try to drive it for an hour and film it for four. And when you're honestly when you're climbing in and out of it and touching everything and whatever, you can get enough of a feel for it 
that it's enough to make a video and enough that you feel comfortable with the driving experience to an extent. It's like you just said, like if you've done a million of these, you have a generally okay idea, at least when you're getting started. One other big benefit is if I'm reviewing the latest Mercedes Benz, it generally has a lot of stuff from other, mo you know, there's not that much stuff. I just shot the new Mercedes S class though. And that has a ton of new technology. And so that was like, I was there the whole day trying to get a handle on all that stuff. Um, it takes a little longer in terms of the longest, like the press cars come for a week. And so that's, that's usually the longest. And depending on the car, I'll drive it for the whole time or Sometimes I'll just only drive it a few times or whatever. It kind of depends on yeah. what it is. Uh, I want to go actually back to Tesla real quick because I just had I've, there's one other thing that I I haven't actually ever asked anybody about this, but you'd be the person to ask. So the, it it feels like the number one uh, contradiction of Tesla to me is the their number one feature is really really fun to drive, crazy acceleration, decent enough handling, like right. video game type stuff. And then number right. two is autopilot. You won't have to drive these things. How how are those the top two? Like, do you have you thought about this at all? Like, the yoke steering wheel is another thing that comes to mind. Like, I'm getting used to the yoke. It's been like two weeks for me, and like the 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 answer you get from them is, well, eventually you won't need steering wheels. So we cut off the top half so you can see the autopilot visualization behind the screen, and all of that is technically true. But also, you just made a car that go zero to 60 faster than anything right. else ever made. You should have a great steering wheel. You know what I mean? Like what, how did, how did, how did right. they reconcile this? It's an interesting question, but don't you think that their thought is they want the highest tech product. And so to do that, they have to have autopilot and that sort of thing, but they also need it to like autopilot alone. Wouldn't make it desirable enough, right? Like a lot of brands have a similar system now. The car has to also be cool as yeah. hell. And in order to do that, then you make it be – and also truthfully for me, like I don't own Tesla, but I, it's clearly trending in that direction. And I, I – for me, I love I, – and I'm like Mr. Car Guy. I've got six cars, whatever. I love nothing more than the concept of sitting in traffic and emailing people while the car drives. And this is kind of sacrilege in the car community yeah. saying this, but like – I have a bunch of fun cars that I take out on the weekend and really enjoy. Um, when I'm sitting in bumper to bumper traffic driving from LA to San Diego after filming, I don't want to do that. I got business, this business to run. I got the channel to manage. I got people I got to reply. I, I don't want to do that. And so there's something, there is something to be said for having a car that does do both, frankly, even though those seem contradictory. Yeah. yeah it's like I would want it to be really good at both. So the point, the point where it like takes away from one or the other is where it gets confusing to me. Like that's where the yoke steering wheel got so confusing and like right. the most fun car to drive that they've ever made is also the most annoying steering wheel. <laughs> <laughs> you find the steering wheel to be annoying? I don't think it's okay, that. Okay, so bad. the steering wheel itself is not the annoying part. The buttons on the wheel, yes, still very annoying. I still... So are you... Is, is turn signals your biggest complaint? Uh, right now it's the headlights because they are too far from my thumb to like be resting and get to them. And the, the horn on the other side. Yeah. Um, the, bl the blinkers yeah. I'm getting used to, but then like still sometimes in my maneuvering of the yoke, I will brush a button or a blinker or like hit the windshield wipers yeah. for some reason. And it's just, it's kind of embarrassing that that yeah. happens. It's not the ideal implementation. You know, it's interesting because Ferrari also has all the stuff as button on, buttons on the wheel, but they implemented it a little bit better. Um, especially turn signals. Ferrari has left turn signal on the left side and right turn signal on the right side, which I think is really nice as opposed to having them next to each other, which is a little bit tough. Um, and yeah, the horn thing, like, come on, just put it in the middle. <laughs> There's, I, I still think that Tesla does a few things for the sake of being different, which can get a little bit annoying. And then that's kind 100%. of 100%. Uh, also, are the Ferraris, is it physical buttons or is it touch buttons? Ferrari, well, actually, it's an interesting question. They, they were, for years and years, they were physical buttons, but the, the two newest Ferraris now have little oh, really? touch buttons. Okay. Like the I got, I, I'm pretty yeah. sure I, I plan to be testing the, I'm going to forget the name, the Stradale, the, the, yeah, yes, the SF90 SF is the one. That's one of the most. Yeah, that, that has moved, that's moved to the touch buttons. And then the Roma, their other new product, they both have those okay. now. And there's been, that's been really controversial. Even the engine start stop button is a touch. Yeah. That's funny. Um, and you know, funny. it's crazy in a Ferrari. Like when I was a, 
younger for or older Ferraris, you you twist the key and you hear the motor fire up, and now you get in and you tap a screen. <laughs> it's the the emotion is a little bit lost, and it's kind of a strange. So way. you've also tested the the electric Hummer, which I wanted to ask you about. Um, you didn't get to you didn't get to drive it either, right? We just had this super right. precious prototype, which I imagine is the same one yes. that <laughs> was in the shade for you, had to be in the shade for me. Yeah. Yep. Um, what do you yep. what do you make of the Hummer going electric? Because I know. I'm not a big Hummer person, but I see a 9,000 pound Hummer and I don't, um, I don't imagine that buyer cares at all about going electric. You know, I would think that too, but this new, this Wrangler 4XE has become tremendously popular, even in just the few months that it's been out, which is the plug-in hybrid Wrangler. And that only does like 20 miles on a single charge. I have several friends already who have gotten them and they love them. And that clearly shows there's actually, there's a market for this stuff. The Hummer is so insane. I think that's the same thing with the Hummer. The performance is there. And so that alone, like it can do all this stuff. And so I think there's going to be people who buy it who are like, I don't care if it's electric or not. And the other thing to keep in mind, it's kind of funny. Everybody associates pickup trucks with the middle of the country. And those buyers are not going to go electric and blah, blah, blah. And that's probably true. But crazy pickup trucks are primarily sold to wealthy people on the coast, like the Ford Raptor. All the sales for that are in the East Coast and in California. That's where they, all those people are. And they'll go electric if it means they can get, you know, zero to 60 in three seconds and roll 13, 15 inches of ground clearance or whatever it is. They'll do that all the time. Yeah, that's like (laughs) the ultimate. That's what's funny about like the Cybertruck and the F-150 Lightning is like, I feel like I'm talking to two very different groups of people because I'm talking about a truck on one hand where it's like utility matters and this thing can power your tools and it's got a huge amount of covered storage and look at all this great utility. Don't you want this better truck? But then there's also this like, yeah premium electric vehicle enthusiast who's like i never wanted a truck but this one is sick like i ordered a cyber truck i i don't need a truck but how many million people are on in the same boat like the cyber truck's kind of cool and i'm i'm an electric car person so here we are it's fascinating do you not feel that the cyber truck is the ugliest thing that you've ever seen in your entire life? okay you know what's funny about that you don't think Mm, that it it isn't actually ugly to me. It it does have a very strange look. It looks like a 2D render sometimes. Like I've I've only seen it in person right. once and I've seen it in various videos. Um but to me it's like the brutish nature of it is kind of endearing. Like they don't care about looking yeah. good, which is like kind of cool to me. I don't know why, it's just interesting. Um but then also like yeah, yeah it's it's just a tool. Like it doesn't have to look that great. Right. Right, right. I'm interested to see how that will go. Um, a lot of people that I know who have never had a truck are interested in that or claim to be. I think that a lot of people don't realize how big trucks are. And I think that will be a huge wake up call for a lot of people. People don't, people who live in like the city and go to Trader Joe's, they think they want this thing. I don't think they quite realize they don't drive right. trucks frequently. I drive trucks to review and even still, when I get into a pickup truck, not even a heavy duty, just a regular F-150 or whatever, I get in and I'm like, this thing is huge. I would not want this in anything other than a rural area or like an exurb or something yeah, like that. I'm trying to park one of those. It's not, and, and I think all these city people who like coming from a Model 3, the city, know. The city is the last go. place I'd want the Cybertruck. Other than parking, which is pretty funny because in the city when it snows and there's just snow banks everywhere and parking is horrific. Yeah, you just, yeah, you just right pull up. up on like a snow bank or whatever. Who's going to stop you? Park? You're going to give me a ticket? I'm just on a right. snow bank. I don't know. Um, right, no, that's right. funny. I There's a lot of like, yeah, the, just the, the questionable like nature of Cybertruck and whether it will actually be able to ship as is and all this other, like I, I put in a, an order and I expect them to make what they showed me, but they're obviously always making changes. So who knows? It's already become clear to me. I don't know what you think of this, but I, they're not going to hit end of year. No. <laughs> I mean, that's, that doesn't seem like that's going to happen. I got in fights with people about that. People on my Twitter were saying this, the Cybertruck's going to beat the Hummer EV to market. It may still, but it'll come by the end of the year. Elon said, and I'm like, no. Eh. No, oh. I I am firmly in the camp of uh, electric cars are harder to make than everyone thinks, including Tesla. So yeah, so <laughs> Elon time is real. Like that will not come out when they say it will. Neither will the Roadster, which was like five years right. ago or something crazy. By the way, um, right. <laughs> no, yeah. I, I I do think though one of the biggest observations I've always had about these new EVs when they get announced is they're always announced for some time way in the future. And they always get compared to like other things in the future versus it's like, it's hard to compare stuff out today with stuff in the future is what I always say. So like F-150 Lightning might come out next year, maybe. 
Um, are we supposed to compare it during its announcement with other stuff available today, or should I compare it with other stuff that right. also doesn't exist that will also maybe come out next year? Um, you don't right. do a ton of like direct head-to-head -head comparisons, but do you ever think about that? And I especially try to avoid future stuff in, in part because of that, because you end up with a lot of stuff that just, I don't, I don't put a lot of faith in what companies tell me. I, I still remember when I went on the launch of the Mazda 6, which is like a little midsize sedan, and they told me, they said, this was in 2014, 13 maybe, they said the diesel version is just six months away. And that never came out. <laughs> but they were very firm yeah. at that launch that the diesel version was six hmm. months away. And um, I don't know. I just – I always think about things like that. It's a little bit difficult, yeah, when an automaker comes out. And yes, I generally don't do a lot of head-to-head -head stuff. Um, I just find people like to focus on individual cars. When I have relevant experience, um, I will talk about that like during the video, like, oh, this truck is whatever. But having the two next to each other, it makes things way more logistically complicated. And I found that it just sort of for some reason diffuses interest a little bit, at least on my channel. I noticed that some channels do a little better with head-to-head -head mm -hmm. stuff, but I've found the opposite. Yeah, unless it's like two really, really obvious rivals, it's usually not as interesting. Um, but I also think what you said, I, I think it's healthy to not just blindly trust everything that comes from a company just because there's so many different variables and so many different people who are talking to each other uh, that your own experience will trump that every time. Like just go with what actually exists. Right. And also in the tech world, I have a saying, only buy something based on what it is now today and not on the promise of some future, especially with software right. updates. Right. They'll software tell you updates, something's coming right, and, right. and must be. it would be nice if it does come out, but don't buy it if you wouldn't like it without that thing, because it might not ever happen. Right, and in some cases, it might not come, or it might come in a year, and then you've purchased it and used it for a year without that thing. That happens, yeah, and it happens in the car world too, honestly, and and um, yeah, for sure. Buy what you like, buy, buy the thing that you're seeing and you're, and you're walking up to and looking at and, and playing with today. I totally agree with that. This episode of Waveform is brought to you by NetSuite. Slow is just right if you're on vacation, or a sloth, or describing QuickBooks. More like slow books, right? Uh, if you know me, I despise slow software, so you can have the most bleeding edge hardware, but if the software doesn't run, well, it's basically pointless. So now is the time to make the switch to NetSuite by Oracle, the number one financial system, because NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, e-commerce, and more. It's everything you need to grow all in one place. So with NetSuite, you can automate your process and close your books in no time, no matter how big your business grows, and you never know how big your business might get. In fact, we're hiring again at MKBHD Studios, and I always make sure my important software doesn't lag behind. So failing to switch to NetSuite will leave you stuck trying to make sense of your books while your competitors sprint ahead. 93% of survey businesses increase their visibility and controls since switching to NetSuite. So special financing is back. NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind financing program only for those ready to switch today. Head to netsuite.com slash waveform right now. That's special financing at n-e-t-s-u-i-t-e dot -E com slash waveform. netsuite.com slash waveform. This episode of Waveform is brought to you by Mini Cooper SE. The Mini Cooper SE is charged for the city and ready to spark up your drive. So unlike other EVs, Mini Cooper SE doesn't look like it's out of a sci-fi movie. It still maintains the classic design that doesn't look too out of place driving around the streets in New York. So with North Jersey potholes, uh, I find myself having to sort of bob and weave around them to get around on the daily. And the Mini Cooper SE is a fun little EV that handles just like a go-kart. It's a zippy little thing. So no matter how many wheel-busting potholes show up in my way, it's actually kind of fun, and I, I definitely avoid them. Uh, I was also pretty impressed with how roomy the car is. So I've never driven a Mini Cooper before this one, but Andrew and I are both over six feet tall. And when we got in there, we took it for a spin, and we were surprised by how comfortable it was. So that was pretty sweet. That was nice. And uh, getting up to an 80% charge takes just 35 minutes with fast charging at level 3 DC fast chargers, but also you can charge overnight or at home with basic AC charging as well. Plus, the unique electric digital instrument cluster inside puts all the important things right at your fingertips. So if you're in the market for a stylish, quick little EV to get you around the city, it's worth checking out the Mini Cooper SE to see if it's right for you. But yeah, it's an interesting world. And yes, the, the, the you know part of the problem, I think, with the... 
the believing what companies say is an interesting concept. You know, the, the Tesla Twitter people are just a completely different level of insane that I've never experienced before. And what that company says is is the word of God to them and, and that they don't believe that there's any, ever any uh, – and I'm pretty positive about Teslas compared to most car reviewers. Um and yet I can still get in – I still get like vicious complaints from some of these people sometimes because I don't believe this thing. Yeah, that that, that might be the – they might be the most defended cars by people who have never actually used them, which is very strange to me because <laughs> in the tech world, there's there yeah. are there are rampant fanboys of certain companies and products even if they don't use them. Like a product will come out from a company they love and if even if they've never used it, they will trust the gospel that is that company's advertising messaging. And if your review goes against it, you must be paid or you must be a shill or you're a fanboy of the other guy. <laughs> the, the frequency of which I'm accused of being paid is quite unbelievable. I'm sure you get this also. I don't get it as much as I, as, as I see some other people get it as much as I expect. I think it's really clear that I try to be really objective. But still, like, and some of the stuff I'm being accused of being paid about is so insane. And I'm just like, what could you possibly be thinking? But that's, I guess, the reality when you're dealing with the general public. Yeah, there's got to be a reason why you don't like the same thing I like. You must Maybe it's because you're paid. I don't know. <laughs> right. That's... It can't be because my taste is yeah. wrong or, or or our tastes differ or whatever. And the other thing, the thing that really is crazy to me, I suspect you don't see this quite as much because the gadgets you're reviewing are less valuable, although you probably do. But in the car world, the amount of personal investment people have in the cars is insane. I frequently make fun of my own cars. Like they're unreliable. I own this convertible Mercedes G-Wagon, which I think is one of the ugliest cars ever made. I talk about that. I'm like totally fine with all that. But when I say something like negative like that about somebody else's car, people, it's it's like you insulted their child. Yeah. And I'm like, how could you take a possession this <laughs> personally? I never have understood that. You know what's that funny behavior. about that? I think I think it's uh, – I actually understand that in the car world because that is probably one of the top two most expensive, important buying decisions you make. And so in a way, it reflects a lot about you and your priorities and your knowledge of the things you could have done, right? So if you get – you spend all that effort and energy – and you make this huge purchase in your life and someone says something bad about it, you kind of feel like you need to defend yourself against it. But in the right. in the tech world, I see a very high level of this around smartphones. And I think it's because not that the, not that they're super valuable, but because they are some of the most personal pieces of tech that you can possibly own. What is more personal? Oh, interesting. It's always exactly. with you. It has all your equipment. It's, it runs it's your photos, life, basically. Your... You're holding it all the time. It's, yeah, it's, it's a yeah. borderline fashion accessory to some people. Like to, to speak right. negatively about, about someone's smartphone purchase decision <laughs> would be like speaking negatively about their hairstyle or something. It's like that's a part of me. <laughs> and that's the way people react, which is always funny. Um, yeah. I've just. I've never gotten into the, the things that I possess. I've never gotten into personally defending them, even the cars. I get that it's an expensive decision, but like you made it, like who cares? You know, like if that's what you decided, then that's what you decided. And and I just, oh, I think people are so, so, so crazy, but they can be so militant um, about some of this stuff. And sometimes I will say something in a video and just be like nervous. Like I know. I'm oh, like yeah, yeah, huge yeah, yeah, yeah. You always know. Yeah. On. <laughs> I know there's a... Th these days I like to defend it just by recognizing like smartphones aren't like young anymore. Like it's kind of hard to get a bad new phone. If you're anywhere in the 300 plus dollar price range of new phones from the big companies, like you can't really get a bad one anymore. Uh, does it feel kind of the right. same way in the car industry? Like obviously if you buy yeah. an old car now, it can be bad. But if you buy a new car, right, it's probably fine. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's kind of funny. I get sometimes I get friends or, or family members coming up to me and saying, "Listen, I'm I've spent hours researching this. I've watched your videos, watched everybody's videos. I'm trying to figure out the best small crossover to buy. Is it the CRV or the Rav4 or the Mazda CX-5?" And they'll be floored when I tell them which dealership is physically closer to your home. <laughs> like we're not talking about none of these will be bad. Like <laughs> You're not going to make a mistake here. There's very, 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 very few bad cars, maybe none on sale yeah. right now. Um, and so that makes it things a little bit easier. Yeah, you're not – I'm not ever starting review ripping up a car anymore. It wasn't quite like that when I first started. There were some like Maseratis were pretty weak in, uh, four or five years ago and I did some tough reviews on those that got a lot of pushback. But 
generally speaking, I, sometimes I just find it insane that people can even get to that level of granularity. If it was me, the CX-5 versus the whatever, which sales person was nicer? Yeah. <laughs> just, just This is not a decision you need my help with. Do you have any regrets from things you said in videos in the past? Things you wish you didn't, oh, maybe wish you edited right. out or... Uh, or <laughs> I always regret when I make a mistake. Oh, I'm yeah, sure yeah. you feel like this too. Like, and and sometimes they're small, but sometimes like I still lie awake at night, you know. Um, but no, I, I I don't think I've ever been wrong, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's like there's being a little bit wrong where it's like maybe you slip and and say the wrong number or the wrong part name or whatever, but it doesn't substantially change the point you were trying to make. And then there's like being wrong where you're like this is bad when it wasn't bad or this is re yeah right, you know, right. relying right making a making an objective individual mistake like a number or something those are annoying i always wish i could take them out i guess the flood of email starts coming in immediately and mm -hmm. i'm like oh crap but actually being wrong about a review i don't know i i like to think that i got them all right the viewers may have different opinions but that's kind of the whole point of this you know that's kind of what we're doing here um the thing that annoys me the most probably and maybe you get this as well the people who tell you that you missed something is really annoying to me. My videos are very long. I've got this Bronco video going up. It's going to be 40 minutes long. I had to cut five. I don't go over 40. I just think that's insane. I had to cut five minutes even to get to that point. But I'm going to get emails from people saying, oh, you missed this. You missed that. And it's like, no, I generally don't miss this stuff. But at some point, you're just – it's too yeah. much. And that's, that's the one that gets to me. It's like, I'm not wrong. I didn't miss it. Yeah, I, that's, I feel like that's why I loved your review of the Corolla, where I you looked at the inside of that car and it was just like, oh, there isn't actually anything here. <laughs> you can really, you really can't say anything about this like blank slate of a car. Uh, I thought that was great. Right, right. That was fun. Yeah, that was an easy one. A ton of people watch that. I, I should do more like that. It's harder when there's more stuff, but some of these cars, there's so much stuff. And Plaid was like that, honestly. There's so much crazy stuff yeah. to cover that it's actually a little bit difficult to cover it all within the span that I've allotted myself. Even 40 minutes, I think, is so long, but sometimes... You yeah, I'm planning uh, a full review of the of the Model S, and like I, I made my first impressions video, which was like, oh, I've had it for literally like three days, and here's... 25 minutes of me spitting out things I think about this car where yeah. like I think my review is probably going to be like 45 minutes long because there's like the charging yeah. infrastructure there's all these other things to talk about with owning the car but uh my problem my biggest problem with when it comes to timing and stuff is that and a lot of people don't quite understand the perspective that I put myself in I have to I have to make the videos for both the in-market car shopper who wants every single piece of information and also the casual fan who just wants to sort of browse videos before oh, yeah. they go to bed and doesn't want overload. And and it's almost – in the car review space, it's almost a unique um, – there's only a couple other channels that sort of speak to both. And it's a tough it's a tough kind of line yeah. to walk. No, to I, I was going to say that's another thing we probably have in common is like I can kind of divide my audience into two similar buckets, which is when a new piece of tech comes out, there are the people who are going to search for it and find the video who are thinking about buying it. And there are the people who are going to watch a new MKBHD video for entertainment. And if you can talk to right. both of those people, right. that's a win. But it's yeah. harder than You've it succeeded. sounds. Yeah. It is. It is. I think people don't quite understand that. The guy, the guys who want the new Bronco and they want to know every little detail, they're not going to be satisfied if you only do 20 minutes. Meanwhile, the other people, they don't want to hear about how the subscription feature works in the infotainment. And it's a, it is kind of a tough thing. And I think a lot of people don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's harder than it seems. This whole, the whole YouTube thing turns out to be a little bit more difficult. It's tough. It's <laughs> tough. We've had some years to get better at it, but it's definitely tough. All right. That's right. I've got, That's right. I've got a, uh, I don't know if you heard about this, but we're doing a an end of podcast test for every guest we have on. And the, the test is, uh, I have a URL I'm going to send you, and it's just a simple typing test of typing the entire alphabet from A to Z. You remember on Top Gear, they'd have like a, a leaderboard of driving an ordinary car around a track, yeah. and like you could sort of like line yeah. yourself up and be like, oh, that's cool, this person did better. Um, this is our version of that. So I'm going to send you uh, the type test and we can see how you score and how you do. And there's no pressure at all. Right. You can give it one or two or three shots even. Do you see the chat section? Oh, really? I'll give you three, I'll give you three shots because I feel like the first try, you kind of learn how it works and then you get two more. Do you, um, do you have to use capital letters? No, you just, just you just straight up? button mash until you get from A to Z. That's it. Oh, this is yeah. easy. And then all you got to do is send me a screenshot of, of which, whichever your best time is. Time? 
Wow, okay, all right, I'm ready, I'm ready. Give me one sec. Okay, here it goes. Oh, damn it. <laughs> what if you, what, wait, what if you mess up now and you go back? Now you gotta just get to Z. Okay, so, so if you, if you, if you, okay, all right, fine, whatever. I'm just gonna do it, I'm, just, I'm not worried. All right, here it goes. Boom, 6.753. Okay. You're going to let yeah, me do it again? Yeah, that was your second try, 6.753. Yeah, although I, the first try I put L in front of K, so I kind of right. stopped. What, does mm, that count? It counts, All right. but that's why I'm giving everybody three tries, because the third try is always the best. <laughs> okay. So now you know exactly how it works. Okay, okay here it goes. Ready? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, pressure. no pressure. No pressure. Okay, here it goes. Boom, 5.9. Nice. What have other five, people nine got? 5.9 flat? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. 5.9 flat. I'm going to send you a Beautiful. I, we did this on Twitter, and first I got a bunch of really good, like, three, two and a half crazy responses, and then people started figuring out how to game it, and they'd write scripts, and they'd get 0 0.1 seconds, so... <laughs> yeah, I noticed. I noticed the leaderboard here. Somebody did it in zero point one. Yeah, I don't know how many how many of those to trust. But I, I, we will do this live with all of our all of our podcast guests and <laughs> and figure out who's the true typing king. So, did you do this with Mr. Beast? I should. Next time right. he's on. So I have no one to compare this um, against. We have. Do you, Adam? What do you remember from our previous? Yours was four point five three nine. I got four point five. Oh my god, my that's crazy. Try. Andrew got down to 5.2, but we've got a couple others in the studio. Oh. I think there's a couple at like 5 or 6 seconds. So there's there's a healthy healthy range. I think it's, I think it'll be fun. It'll be interesting. <laughs> this was too slow. If I had I I needed to prepare substantially better. Everybody else is going to be able to prepare like the top gear star thing, you know, they're going to get like That's lessons. true. We got to keep it a surprise as many as people as we possibly can. <laughs> Doug, thank yeah. you. Thank you for topping on the podcast. I know you're a busy guy, so I don't want to take all of your day, but this is really yeah. fun. No, thank should, you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we should do it, it again sometime, and I am really looking forward to that plaid review. Your Model S review video is coming, coming soon. Yes, thank you, and I'm so jealous that you have one. Enjoy. I certainly <laughs> will. Appreciate it, man. Yeah. Take care. See ya. So that that was Doug Demiro. That that was a lot of fun. I have I always enjoy talking to fellow creators, but obviously when we have a lot in common, it's great. Were you impressed with his type test? He time? did pretty good. It's yeah, pretty good. He, did, he beat half the people that work here. I mean, podcast crew still on top, sure. still representing. But sure. um, we will. I'm sure we will get beat eventually. He had a really good point that you know you can only get caught off guard for so long. It's kind of like when you watch Hot Ones and guests are ready for the sauce. I yeah. feel like people are going to start preparing for the alphabet test. We'll see. You know, they still have to face the pressure in that, though. I mean, True. people for the reasonably priced card could have prepared for it. True. There's nothing against that, so they might. True. This is much easier to do. But anyways, uh, yeah, great episode. That was really fun to listen to. Yeah, I think we're this studio is built to start having guests and have more people yeah, hang sure. out with us and chat. Of course, creators, but all sorts of people from the industry will, of course, also have people on virtually like we just did. But... Let us know what other types of guests you'd like to have on because we are all about starting that up. Yeah, for sure. Um, either way, that's been it. Until the next one, catch you guys later. Peace. This week's... I can't do that. I feel like I'm so bad. <laughs> this week's episode was produced by Adam Molino. We are partner with Studio 71 and our intro-outro music was created by Vane Sill.